From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode number 225, recorded on December 15th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent, and everybody else. And um, let's see, we usually give a weather report. It was kind of a nice day today, but a little bit cold, uh, sunny, uh, with a breeze of, man, let's say it was about 40 degrees out. But, also, okay. also joining us from Panama, Daniel Griffin. <laughs> Hello, everyone. With you know, remarks. I usually don't count about the weather, right? But I will say the last week here in Panama, it has very much been the rainy season, uh, and uh, which makes for a bit of a challenge when you're spending uh, much of your day traveling by boat, sleeping in hammocks in small villages. Is um, it uh, really warm there, Daniel? Uh, yes, <laughs> it is. Yeah. Perhaps a little too warm for some folk. All right. Also joining us from Glasgow, Scotland, Christina Naula. Evening all, it's really good to see you. Um, I'm not going to give you a weather report because it's the usual Glasgow weather. All right, and we have a guest in studio today. He's an infectious disease fellow at Weill Cornell Medical Center, Lee Gottesdiener. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here. He's right here at the incubator, Daniel. How about welcome. that? I, I like that. I'm seeing the cool background. Well, <laughs> welcome, Lee. This is exciting. Because our, our case um, for this week was Lee's case from two episodes ago, right, Daniel? Exactly. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Not uh -huh. hard for you to get here, right? Very easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have the new su the Q subway. It gets you across town now, right? So many ways to go. Yeah, it's really good. All right, uh, before we start, remember... We need your support to do these programs. If you like what we do, we'd love to have your financial support. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. And, and if you go to microbe TV, now you will see a big button at the top of the page, <laughs> which I have, I have asked for for so long. Donate to microbe TV today. It's just so prominent. I love it. <laughs> help us. We need your help. All right, uh, Daniel, we're going to let, Lee, give the uh, summary of last week's case. Lee, yes. Uh, hopefully, we, we now know that Lee is a TWIP listener. Um, so, uh, so for those of you tuning back in, those of you tuning in for the first time, Lee, take it from there. Let me ask you, Lee, um, how did this come about? Did, uh, did you contact Daniel and said, I have a case or what? So one of my uh, mentors, uh, Priya Kodian Plakal, who did yeah. the podcast with you guys, knew about this case and talked to, to Daniel and... You guys were very gracious to invite me here. Oh, cool. All right. All right, do it. All right. So this is a man in his 40s with minimal past medical history who presents for right upper extremity swelling. Actually, over the last five to 10 years, he's noticed these transient episodes of swelling at his upper or lower extremities that occur only every few months. And it will start with a warm and itchy sensation that then progresses to what he describes as a goose egg at his hand or his foot. Sometimes it'll travel up the extremity or have associated uh, finger swelling, uh, but it will usually last only on the order of hours and then it will go away and not return for many more months. But he came into the emergency department for an episode at his right upper extremity that he thought was particularly severe. So to say a little bit more about his history, for his job, he's a veterinarian by training and performs epidemiologic work. So because of this, he has a relatively extensive travel history for field work, primarily in sub-Saharan Africa. These trips started around seven years prior to this presentation, first to Ghana, then the Republic of the Congo, Uganda, and Rwanda, uh, but most extensively to Liberia, where he's had about six trips over the last five years. Each trip is for about two weeks long, and he'll have contact with a number of animals, including rodents, bats, and birds. He has also traveled to South and Southeast Asia a number of times, but generally not for field work. 
So in the emergency department, his exam is really remarkable for swelling throughout his right hand, uh, including the fingers, but it's non-tender, not particularly erythematous. Otherwise, the rest of exam, his exam is really totally benign. Um, his absolute eosinophil count is 730. I have to apologize, that's a little lower than what was provided at mm. the teaser, but uh, still mildly elevated eosinophilia. Uh, and most of his other basic labs are unremarkable. So in the ED, I think they weren't exactly sure what this was. Could it be a cellulitis, some kind of inflammatory condition? They discharged him with a short course of both antibiotics and steroids and referred him to rheumatology uh, as an outpatient, as their, their best guess for who could figure it out. But unfortunately, the diagnosis was never elucidated. So he continued on living his life, still having these episodes of swelling only every six months or so until about two or three years later when he noticed a prickling sensation under his eyelid mm -hmm. and he looked in the mirror and saw an undulating movement under the skin of his eyelid. And I think that's where Daniel left us last time. <laughs> All right. We had a number of case guesses. And as with last time, we're going to have a vocal artist read them for you. Many of you <laughs> like that. And so here they go. The first Vienna Parasitology Passion Club writes... Dear Calabar Rators, as always, we are writing to you from a very sunny but cold Boston and from rainy Vienna. Last week it snowed in Vienna and everything is now looking even more beautiful than it usually does. Our patient is a 46-year-old male without significant past medical history except for episodic swellings of the right upper extremity for the last 5 to 10 years. A few years ago, he also started noticing an irritating sensation under his right eyelid. He works as a vet and an epidemiologist and reports extensive travel history to Africa with animal contact with bats, rodents, and birds. When first hearing about the patient's symptoms, a few thoughts come to mind. The prickling sensation could be caused by an infection with onchocerciasis, river blindness, or acanthamoeba keratitis, but combined with the traveling swellings, it starts to sound a lot like loiasis. Loiasis, also called the African eye worm, is a filarial disease transmitted by the flies Chrysops silacea and Chrysops dimidiata. These flies bite the host to take a blood meal and lay third-stage larvae on the skin, which then enter the skin through the bite wound. The larvae then grow up into adult worms. This process takes up to five months. Adult worms later produce microfiliariae, which start to penetrate into various tissues and organs and can reside there for many years. The swellings encountered in Loa Loa patients are actually angioedema. They occur episodically and are called calabar swellings. Originally, they were named by a Scottish physician who observed these swellings in a woman who had returned home after living in Calabar, modern-day Nigeria, for several years. The swellings are non-tender and can feel itchy. Other symptoms caused by the disease include itchiness all over the body, hives, muscle pains, joint pains, and tiredness. Additionally, adult worms may be seen moving under the skin. More severe but very rare symptoms include kidney damage, lung edema, and lung infection, etc. Diagnosis can be usually made by microbiological identification of the worm taken from the eye, by identifying microfiliariae in a blood smear, or by serological testing. Blood should be drawn around midday, as the concentration of microfiliariae is the highest at this time. For returning travelers, the timing of the blood draws should be adjusted to the time zone they recently came from, as this only starts to adjust after about two weeks. Treatment can include surgery to remove single worms found in or around the eye. However, this treatment aims only to relieve the anxiety of the patient. To achieve cure, treatment with diethylcarbamazine, DEC, is most effective as it targets both microfiliariae and adult worms. However, with higher circulating levels of microfiliariae, adverse reactions like urticaria, swellings, and encephalopathy become more common. While apheresis can be used to decrease microfiliariae levels, prolonged administration of albendazole to kill adult worms and thereby reduce microfiliariae levels has become more common. 
It is not uncommon for patients to require several courses of DEC before achieving complete cure. However, these data come from endemic areas where continuous exposure is likely and returning travelers may have higher cure rates. Before DEC treatment, onchocerciasis should be excluded or pretreatment with ivermectin administered well in advance in order to avoid the dreaded Mazzotti reaction and inflammation of skin and eyes. There is no vaccine for prevention of loiasis. Exposure prophylaxis is recommended for all travelers and permanent residents of endemic areas, which are largely contained with high endemicity areas for malaria transmission. There are no mass drug administration campaigns aimed at reducing the burden of loiasis. Long-term travelers can take DEC chemoprophylaxis to reduce symptoms. Thank you for this great case. All the best. Michelle and Alexander from the First Vienna Parasitology Passion Club. Agnese writes, Dear Professors, Thank you for another amazing case. I think, from the hint of the eye, that we are talking about Loa Loa. It would match the intermittent long-standing swelling, the worm crossing the eye, and the travel anamnesis. He said he also had traveled to Southeast Asia, so maybe nathostomiasis should be also in the differential. But he stayed in the endemic area for a short time, and the excursion of the worm to the eye is less typical. Hope you are still drawing names for the book. Thank you for your amazing podcast. Agnese. Eyal writes, Dear Vincent and the sages of the microscopic eukaryotes, Greetings from Sydney and the land down under, Where women glow and men plunder, Where summer has truly arrived. It's now 30 degrees Celsius and hot with over 40 degrees Celsius expected for tomorrow. I apologize for not submitting my guesses in time for the last few episodes. I've been preoccupied with everything happening in the world lately. However, I'm still listening to all the twicks religiously. I've been utterly wrong in my last few guesses. Hopefully I can do better this time. As for the 46-year-old male with extensive travels to Central and West Africa, who had recurring swelling in his extremities and maybe recently some movement under the eyelid. First, I tried to look at worm parasites in Liberia, Ghana, Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, and Rwanda that caused swelling and came up with the following list. Eukarya bancrofti causes lymphatic filariasis or elephantitis. Loa loa causes localized swelling known as calabar swellings in the extremities and migrates to the eye. Onchocerca volvulus causes river blindness. Since there was no mention of a fast-flowing river and the swelling symptoms resolve within days and the mention of a movement under the eye, my guess would be Loa Loa. As always, it is such a pleasure to listen and learn from all of you. Thank you so much. Eyal. Rafid writes, Hello, TWIP team. Greetings from rural Quebec. With the arrival of winter, the hospital where I work has been very busy with patients presenting with respiratory illnesses and their complications, so I have not too much time to analyze this case. My best quick guess for a patient who has traveled to Central Africa and now has seen something cross his eye and has transient swellings of his extremities, which sound like calabar swellings, is the filarial loa loa disease. This parasite is transmitted by the deer fly. This horrible insect is ubiquitous in rural Quebec in the hot summer months. I can't leave my house or take a walk in the woods, let alone go for a run without being attacked by these nasty creatures that take a painful bite out of you. They are DEET resistant, very rapid, and very difficult to kill. Even when you smack them, they only get winded and get up and fly away a few moments later. These bugs don't like the city, however. And even if I run on a country road that's paved, they leave me alone. Therefore, I assume that our patient got infected because his work took him deep into the bush. Luckily, it is negative 10 degrees Celsius today, so I can go for a run without being attacked by these monsters. Thank you again for your time, and thank you, Vincent, as I got an email yesterday saying that the parasitology book that you guys gifted me is on the way. Can't wait to see it. Rafid. Felix writes, Dear hosts, greetings from snowy South Germany. My guess for the case of migrating joint swelling and eye irritation is Loa Loa. I'm a bit unsure why the lab work is unremarkable and there is no eosinophilia, but I guess in chronically infected patients it may be the case. Now we need to find the microfiliariae in the blood or catch the worm red-handed in the eye. For treatment, DEC is recommended after ruling out risk factors for encephalopathy. I would love to know how you proceed if there is heavy infection or risk factors. Other parasitic differentials could be nathostomiasis or mensoleliasis. Until next time, Felix. Hawken writes, Hello, cast and crew of TWIP. 
Greetings from balmy, albeit wet, Athens, Georgia. It's funny that your case involved a little white worm peeking out of an eye, as just this last week, a friend of mine reached out asking about a similar problem in his dog, which I have attached a photo up below. While I am certain our veterinary epidemiologist probably didn't get Oncocerca lupi from a southern U.S. state like this dog did, his case did make me wonder about the myriad different filarial worms he could have acquired. Depending on the size of the nematode extracted from his eye and the morphology, could also look at the microfiliaria in the blood. It could be Loa Loa, O. vulvulus, uh, Wucaria bancrofti, or Brugia malai. Originally, I had the lazy on the list as well, but given his skin issues and swelling from a filarial worm from his travels throughout Africa or Southeast Asia seems most reasonable. Final guess, Oncocerca volvulus. Treatment would be DEC and ivermectin, but depending on the size of the nematode burden, it might be prudent to consult a specialist to avoid a Mazzotti reaction. All the best, Hawken. Anthony writes... Appears to be some sort of larva migrants. Loa loa, nathostoma, and uh, dyrofilaria reopens are all possible. Anthony. Uh, anything else, Daniel? No, I, th- I think that's great. And I think our uh, email guesses are impressed, as always, with our, our listeners. And, and I like some of the guesses. I also like some of the differentials they threw our way. Um, and I guess, um, you know, I, I do know what it is, but it, I think we've got three more people who may want to jump in with some, <laughs> some guesses. And, and I, I got the sense last time that, that Dixon felt very confident in his, <laughs> uh, in his answer. So should we, should we let you go first, Dixon? If you like. Uh, oh, you're not going to read all this? Oh, okay, fine. We have um, a, a voice artist read them, Dixon. Uh, oh, gotcha, 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 gotcha. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we haven't had that before. Okay, fine. So, um, well, my my guess is not a guess, actually, because I used to teach this subject to our medical students. And unfortunately, I never got to teach this one. But this is one that I've actually had personal experience with because I once I was sitting in my desk minding my own business when I got a phone call from the emergency room saying, uh, Dr. Depomier, um, would you please help us out? And I said, of course. And, I, and they said, well, I've got a man down here. He's from Ghana, and he claims to have a worm in his eye. <laughs> what should I do? I said, take it out. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> uh, the worm turned out to be uh, the parasite, which everyone loves, because it's really easy to remember the name of this parasite. It's called Loa Loa. That's not my guess, because uh, I don't think <laughs> we had so much information that it was hard not to to know this if you were uh, savvy about the fluoriasis field. And uh, I've had some experience with that as well. So, yeah, my my um, my diagnosis without seeing anything more. If you had given us one more clue, it would have been not a it would have been no fun at all. <laughs> Although this was fun. Uh, yeah, low, low is my guess. All right, Christina, did you want to jump in? Um, I'm noticing your sweater matches the wall behind you. So, <laughs> oh yeah, it does. I'm, I'm wearing my sparkly <laughs> Christmas jumper, you know, for a bit of special cheer. Um, so, my guess, I was thinking um, the swellings described they sounded a bit like calabar swellings. Although you'd also describe them as goose goose egg swellings, and I'm not sure. Um, the, the, the images of calabar swellings that I've seen don't really look like goose eggs, but I suppose, you know, it could be. So I was thinking also at the epidemiology, so he had traveled um, in an area where Loa Loa is um, present. Although you did mention that he had quite extensively traveled in Liberia, and I think Loa Loa endemicity is actually quite low there. So... Um, I mean, but the symptoms sound, it could be lower, lower. And then the other thing, then all of a sudden I remember the Ugandan eye worm, which is another filarial infection. Um, so Manzanella perstans, and he had been in Uganda, although not for a very long time. And actually Manzanella perstans can also cause calabar swellings um, occasionally. Um, so uh, probably because... Loa Loa is more common. I would probably veer towards that one, but I think it could potentially also be Manzanella perstans. 
Um, mm. I'm not sure. I'd like to know more, maybe have a blood, a blood film to look at before I would um, finalize my diagnosis. Yeah, no, I like that. You know, I having spent a lot of time in Uganda, actually, I was there about a week ago, um, and uh, which is quite a trip from Uganda to Panama, um, by the way, I do not recommend it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, that, I think that's uh, part of the differential a lot of people wouldn't necessarily think about, but including the Ugandan eye worm in the differential. Um, yeah, you know, I think low, low is sort of the, the most common. Um, but uh, Vincent. Well, when I saw this, undulation under the eyelid. I immediately thought of Loa Loa because, you know, Dixon and I did all the first 20 episodes of TWIP were each on a separate parasite. And this one, this one struck, stuck with me, the Loa Loa one. It was just great. I couldn't, I'd never heard of it before. And this idea that this worm is crawling around and then you could just pull it out with the tweezers, right? It was just And it's fabulous. famous also. That's the only thing. It's quite amazing, actually. So that's, that, that would be my uh, naive guess, I suppose. So, uh, Lee, what uh, what did you do next here? Sure. So I can tell you kind of what happened next. So that night when he felt the movement uh, and looked at his eye, he did then see the worm moving across his eye. So he went back to the emergency department, although I will say he's a, he was very cool, calm, and collected, which I do not think I would be if I was in the same situation. <laughs> uh, he actually took a really nice video of the worm moving across his eye, and it was um, visualized by multiple doctors in the EDs with the presumptive diagnosis of Loa Loa. Um, and that was when they called infectious diseases from the emergency department. So they weren't able to take the worm out in the emergency department that night, but he saw me in clinic the next day. Um, his conjunctiva was pretty injected and he was sort of uncomfortable appearing, but we couldn't actually see the worm at that point. The story he told was that he had put an ice pack on his eye and the worm had sort of scurried away. Mm. I'm not sure if the pathophysiology checks out for that or not, but it seems like that's what happened. Um, so what we did was we immediately performed a parasite smear. I know you were asking for that um, in the early afternoon because the timing of day was important. Uh, walked it across to the lab and he actually did not have any microfilaremia. We saw no parasites there. Um, but we did send a commercial anti-filarial IgG4 that was quite elevated, as well as one to the NIH, um, which was also elevated. And I should definitely shout out to the NIH and CDC, who were a ton of help as expected for this. They were very letter readily available and very gracious with their help. Um, but the NIH also had a special multiplex serology panel available. Um, for which Loa Loa specific IgG4 was positive. And it also helped us rule out other filarial co-infections because it was negative for Wuchereria and Oncocerca. Um, and so we were able to um, then move forward with treatment for him. We were able to obtain diethylcarbamazine DEC from the CDC um, in order to treat him for 21 days. So we had both an explanation for his calabar swellings and we were able to treat him. But you never got the worm. So we never got the worm. He actually, <laughs> yeah, the worm was, was a very tricky guy. Um, he actually went to an ophthalmologist and waited on standby in case the worm appeared. Um, but um, he kind of hung out all day, but the worm never did. But I think we do actually know what happened to the worm because... A few days after taking DEC, well, first he got another calabar swelling, but then he developed a kind of interesting little serpiginous rash at his trunk um, that stuck around for about two weeks before fading away. And I think that probably represented the final resting place yeah. of the worm. <laughs> it died there. Yes. Right. Interesting. I, I, I could interject something here that really confirms the uh, behavior of the worm. Um, there, I, I got my PhD at Notre Dame, and the person who I was going to work with who left, uh, I presume, as soon as he heard I was accepted, he, he went over to <laughs> Lebanon uh, <laughs> to the American University for three-year sabbatical, uh, which was not a nice thing for him to do, but uh, I was very familiar with his work. And what he worked on was uh, – he worked on uh, – I guess you call it the taxis. Um, he was interested in knowing uh, why parasites locate to certain areas of the body. 
And it turns out that uh, the work that he did uh, using a thermal migrator device that he invented himself, um, he came up with a, a really interesting finding, and that is that if you put a worm in the middle of a thermal device where the temperature at the bottom is five degrees um, less than the temperature at the top of this gradient, and it's, it's a foot long, and you put the worm right in the middle, if it's a parasite, it will migrate towards the heat end. But if it's a free-living worm, like Cenorhabditis elegans or some of the other worms that you might be familiar with, uh, like earthworms, <laughs> but other nematodes, it will migrate towards the cold end. So if you make it cold for the parasite, it will migrate away from the cold towards the heat. And that was the interior uh, portion of the body. This worm is not a an interior worm, though it stays in the subcutaneous tissues no matter what. So that's quite a trip for this worm to make from the eye to the trunk of the body in a matter of, what, a couple of days? Yeah. Uh, that's remarkable. I mean, this worm must really be... A, trekking, as they would say. <laughs> and I wonder if, because it lives in the subcutaneous tissues, it's it's put off by the higher temperature that it finds on the inside, because, I mean, that's usually the way it's uh, acquired, because you uh, get bitten by a, a vector that deposits the larva and it goes into the blood. So it's, it's really quite remarkable to see how this worm uh, responded and uh, we we had a similar worm that uh, was in the anterior chamber of the eye. It was a dirofilaria worm doing this, so we figured put the guy on his uh, face on a on a massage table overnight so that the worm would stay there. And this this worm turns out to be negatively geotropic, so it migrates away from the pull of gravity and it migrated through the optic nerve and never oh. to be seen again. And without harming anybody, and the, the worm, it's amazing, the, um, the, the deals that worms make with your immune system not to uh, make things rougher than it is, usually until they die. <laughs> I like that. The deals that yeah, worms they, make with, with your, your immune system. system. So should we talk a little bit about maybe it's a chance to talk a little bit about the lifestyle and yeah, the please. lifestyle and life cycle go, go, of the parasite yeah, and also it. kind of the importance about treatment as far as co-infections. So uh, yeah. uh, I, I will just start with my mnemonic, right? How do you remember the different vectors, right? And I always have my, you know, for river blindness, it's the black fly, right? Because, you know, the blindness and for the loa loa, you know, you say it twice, almost like a pet name. So it's transmitted by the deer fly. Um, <laughs> I don't know. People could take that, maybe help them pass that tropical medicine exam. Um, but uh, yeah, Lee, so the, the deer fly bites you and what happens? So the the deer fly bites you and um, I think it uh, causes a, a break in the skin. And I think the, the larva deposits on the skin and then migrates That's down right. into, the, right. into the into the bloodstream. Right. Is that correct? Yeah, that's actually a, sort of an important subtlety, right? It's not like a proboscis injection. It's a bite and then a deposition and an introduction. I'm not sure it goes into the bloodstream, though, are you? Oh. I don't know that. Yeah, I know yeah I'm not sure it actually. Area. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think it's not so Sorry much entering that. the blood, but yeah, the I, entering I, I at that the cut site. I think stays in the subcutaneous mm. tissue, mm -hmm. you know, like trunculus. And it's not uh, yep. until the microfilaria are exactly. produced that they go yep. into the bloodstream. Which Thanks. have probably the opposite attraction for heat than the adult. And that would be very interesting to show. And you could actually do that experiment if you had the if you had two stages together. I, I would love to know the answer to that one. So Dixon, the microfilaria end up in the eye? Is that how it works? No, no, no. The, the, the microfilaria end up in the blood, so they penetrate right. out of the subcutaneous right. tissues in uh -huh. the blood so that the chrysops flies, the deer fly, can pick it up from a pool of blood that it creates by these scissor-like devices that it uses to penetrate your skin, and it feels like you're being stabbed a thousand times with a dagger. It's really painful. The bite of a deer fly is very painful. So uh, humans are the reservoir as well? 
or their animal it's reservoir. Right. I don't think there are reservoir house through Loma Loa. But so Actually, comes, there are. There are because I've tell just tell us become, about it. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, there's not much now, but it's known that several primate species can be infected. Mm. But I think uh, it's considered zoonotic transmission is considered negligible because of the spatial separation of the animals. So it's kind of it's it's primates. Um, they're not necessarily close by, and then also. Um, um, what I read is that there's different vector species that have different feeding habits. So I, th I think in the human, it's diurnal. And in the, uh, for the um, primate transmission, it's a nocturnal vector um, biting. So I, I just read one paper completely random not so long ago. Um, I haven't followed it up, but there's definitely um, okay. infection of several primate species. And I've, I think I've got... A, a yellow macaque in mind somehow, but need to need to dig out the. But that reference. doesn't mean it's a reservoir. It just means that it's no, good. not necessarily. No, that's why I said that zoonotic transmission is considered right. to be negligible, right. Right. but you know potentially. All right, so it's human to human transmission. Then is that correct? Mm. Basically. All right, now Dixon, take us to the eye. How does this get to the eye? Well, the worm uh, grows up as an adult in the subcutaneous tissue, yeah. and it stays in the subcutaneous tissue. And believe it or not, the sclera of the eye is contiguous with the rest of the subcutaneous tissue of your body. So as it migrates, it doesn't, it has no uh, tropism for the eye, but during its trip, shall I say, through the body, you know, let's uh, let's see, what should we do tomorrow? Perhaps the buttock. No, no, don't go there. They sit down on that a lot. Um, maybe you can do the forearm. I thought the forearm was a good idea. Uh, yeah. The worm seems to be a random walk type of thing, and uh, I'm not sure what it depends on. Uh, I don't think there's any immunological uh, deterrent that prevents the worm from going to a specific spot in the, in the body, in the subcutaneous mm -hmm. tissues. However, it does leave a trail of antigen, and that trail of antigen is what induces the calabar swelling wherever it occurs. And by the way, uh, I don't think um, Mancinella ozardi could cause a calabar swelling unless the patient that was identified with Mancinella ozardi was from old calabar, because that's how this worm got that hook. <laughs> I think Mancinella perstans it was. Uh, okay, purse stands. Yep, yep. uh, I've looked you up in your book. <laughs> <laughs> She's word using her own words against us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's easy to, do, easy to do. <laughs> so so um, this individual Dixon had yes. many years of infection and the worm was yeah, just moving right. to different yeah. places and that's what was causing the swellings, right? Well, and no, then, no, the swellings were introduced by the immune system. Okay. Reacting yeah. against this worm. Sure. And eventually I, it made its way to the eye and that's when you saw that's it. Right. Right? That's exactly right. Wow. Yeah, that's an interesting issue because I've heard stories about like, you know, patients see these swellings and then they get themselves a scalpel, right? And they're trying to dig out, you know, what is this that's in there? Um, and the, the swelling is is really not where the worm is, right? It's where the worm was. So I once heard a lecture, you know, presenting, oh, and they're like cutting them out. with. I'm like, no, they're not because by the time they're cutting, they're already gone. Correct. Um, but yeah, so it's a it's an immunological. But it is. I mean, these these guys move and they move all over the place um, and fast. Yeah. I mean, Do we have any information about how many adult worms there are per infection? Yeah. Because some, when we talk about intensity, we usually refer to the microfilaria, don't we? Yes. I, I, I don't know. Do we have any? Information, and how many adults? He had no microfilaria, so maybe he just had a couple of adults. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Now, now you, I you, have to say, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Like, when you get this, like, how many adults do you have? Um, depends well, I guess on you have to at least one male and one female. You know, it's Sir Robert Argyle... Uh, who discovered this parasite's um, identity of the of the pupils <laughs> of the pupils? That's right, <laughs> and of the socks too. Robert Argyle yes. socks, uh, <laughs> really? a Scotsman, and his housekeeper oh. was from Old Calabar, and he was very fortunate in that she had one adult male and one adult female, and he took both of those worms out, and he described both the male and the female worm because of that. But I think in this guy's case. Uh, he might only have a couple of adult worms altogether. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
the odds are maybe they're both male or maybe they're all three of them were females and therefore there were no microfilaria. You had never seen this kind of case before, right? No, this was definitely, you know, I've always seen the pictures of it, but this was definitely a <laughs> first for me. Right. I don't know if I ever will again. <laughs> Daniel, have you seen these in the U.S.? Uh, I'm trying to think if I have. No, actually, this is no. this is not very common in the U.S., right? This is something, and even, you know, it's not even that common in sub-Saharan Africa. There's really just localized areas, mm. uh, you know, like Cameroon, the DRC. Um, I don't think even you see much in Ghana anymore, so. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's gone from Ghana. <laughs> um, I don't know if Ghana has um, declared it um, eradicated, but we're you know we're still seeing in in Cameroon, we're still seeing it in the DRC. Um, I don't know if there's any kind of designation, but I don't think it's common at all. I, wow. I think it may not even be much in Ghana. I'd have to look, but to be Daniel, in your travels, have you ever been bitten by a deer fly? Ooh. I am sure I have. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, deer fly, tsetse fly, all kinds of the good stuff, you know. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, just yesterday I was bitten by some type of an ant that hurts so much that I did wait to finally sit down and then just take a deep breath and avoid any profanity. But ouch. <laughs> they have an ant called bullet ant. There's a bullet ant. Yeah, I was right. avoiding the soldier ants, the, the leaf oh, cutter right. ants, and yeah. somehow, you know. While I was watching the howler monkeys up in the forest, you know, suddenly I felt like someone had just stabbed me in the ankle. So, <laughs> right, right, arg. All right. Anything else about this? We have to give away a book before. We I just well, I think to the clarify other that a was, mistake I made yeah, earlier. I, yep. Go ahead. Oh, what was that? Yeah, so it was actually not a yellow macaque, but a yellow baboon. Okay. Oh, okay. oh well, that makes all the difference. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you need to be precise. <laughs> You would have haunted yeah. to me otherwise. I didn't know well, no, the other I just wanted to make sure we bring up is this this whole issue of, um, you know, why you want to look for co-infections, right? Uh, because, you know, we always think like, oh, you know, Loa and Loa, well, what's the problem? Well, you know, it crawls across your eye and that bothers you. And it's, it's a, oh, that's just cosmetic, right? I mean, welcome to the United States. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but that is what disturbs people. But where you get into most problems, even though some people with loa loa can get, you know, serious cardiomyopathies or nephropathies or polar fusions, other things. It's often when we jump in with our treatments that we cause the the biggest uh, problem. So Lee, I don't know if you wanted to jump in on that. Yeah, I think the the main one to look out for is Oncocerca, because if you have an Oncocerca co-infection, then the diethylcarbamazine can lead to an inflammatory response that can um, particularly also in the, the eye, um, coincidentally, um, eventually lead to, to blindness potentially. Is that right? That's, that's the first thing to think about. The other thing to say is just that ivermectin, although it's a great drug for many things, uh, eliminates the microfilaria in Oncocerca, not the adults. And that would probably be true also for Loa Loa. Although there is a reaction that it, it induces uh, in that sense, so it's not a good drug to to use against the adult. Yeah, this. I mean, this is one of those where your question is so relevant. Of you know, where is this present? Because you really need to know in an area: right. is there oncocerca? Is there a loa loa co-infection? And there was really a horrible story where they were they were going in with the DEC treatment, mm -hmm. and you know they talked to the local you know leaders, they talked to the the head of this tribe, and um, just you know really bad um, odds, whatever it is, but it ends up the son of the tribal leader ends up developing a horrible encephalopathy okay. with, with oh, this mass drug okay. campaign that they come in with oh, um, because they weren't, you know, checking all these levels. And, uh, you know, that, that's kind of the end of any sort of a trust relationship if you're not careful about you also, go in, you know. And, and right now things are status quo, but now, you know, this sort of causal connection that you, you induce this. Um, so, yeah, it's really important to understand um, a lot of the dynamics, the, the economy of what's going on. Probably didn't know that before that either. So, yeah. I mean, a lot of times they find out these things by these uh, well-intentioned programs, which end up uh, being uh, disasters in some cases. I mean, I remember, not to waste any more of our time, because we've got a paper to get to, um, when the uh, Bangladesh became a country, I believe it was in 1976, uh, the WHO stepped in and said the main problem with this country is right now they're suffering from anemia. 
Mm. They determined that no matter what. And they didn't say why. Okay, so there could have been a couple of reasons. One is that they had a lot of hookworm there, which they did. And the other is that they had a lot of malaria, which they did. <clears throat> but the point is that uh, when you have a lot of anemia uh, caused by malaria, at least, um, or by hookworm, I'm sorry, by hookworm, the malaria parasites don't do well. So that's, they didn't know that, so they started to treat everybody with iron to up the levels of uh, uh, reserves, and they induced, of course, multiple fatalities in small children that had um, latent plasmodium falciparum, and they found that out by mass treating with uh, iron. Uh, unbeknownst to them, of course, they had no idea that, that this was connected in some way. And uh, WHO lost its uh, credibility in that country for many years afterwards as a result. And yeah. that's the real danger is that these these are well-intentioned NGOs and uh, international organizations that want to do the best they can. And in doing that, they, they make these uh, fatal mistakes by not knowing enough about the situation. Well, as, as you know, Dixon, they, they tried to treat people in Egypt for schistosomiasis and they gave them all hepatitis C because they didn't <laughs> sterilize the needles. How about that? And so now Egypt has the highest burden of hep C in the world. Yeah, except that now they're taking pills rather than injections, so that's at least partly a savior. I don't yeah. think prostate hormone is injected right now. No, the hep C drugs are, are pills. That's oh, fine, right. but that was they should have used... Sure, sure. No, that's right. You're yeah. right. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, so we in our appendix, we actually go a little bit into here about like, you know, if you, you know, if you have microfilaria above or below a certain level, if it's above a certain level, actually try to drop things first, mm -hmm. uh, like with albendazole. And once you get below that 2,500, then you can actually start looking at, at DEC. But this is one of those things. I mean, I, I know during the last four years for, I'm not sure exactly what drove people to do this, but there was a lot of ivermectin use for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, in certain areas of the world, th this actually would be not so much a drug side effect as a drug complication used right. in the wrong context so right right exactly but, all right lee did you have anything else we should throw at this or christina you too i'm seeing all this energy yes 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 <laughs> christina. Very keen to throw in another little nugget of information you know how quite a, quite many of the filarial worms they have um wolbachia um, endosymbionts and one thing that I remember very clearly from our course um, the Diploma in Tropical Medicine and Hygiene is that loa loa do not correct, so correct. I, I think that might yeah. be quite important because you wouldn't really then ever consider I suppose doxycycline as a treatment yeah. I'm just throwing it in because our students. Yeah, no, that's them, that's you know, one of those that's question, one of those great so. test questions, right? Yes, exactly. Like, name a filarial worm that doesn't have a Wolbachia yep. symbiont, and yes, Loa yep. Loa. Hmm. Interesting. All right, well, let's give away a book. And we shipped out a lot of books this week, folks. Good. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> many of them went to foreign countries, and uh, hope you get them soon. Hope hope the box doesn't arrive empty. Wait, you want a drum roll <laughs> okay. for this? Miss it again? So as far as I can tell, <clears throat> there are four people who uh, didn't didn't win books before. So uh, oh, okay. yeah, let's pick an, a random number between one and four. <laughs> it's one. It's not hard to get a random number. Number one is, who's number one? The Vienna Aristotelian no, no, Club. Agnese. On, oh. you know, Vienna already won one, I'm pretty sure. Oh, I, I, I gotcha, I gotcha, I gotcha. I believe Vienna, which is Michelle and Alex. Right. I think we sent them two maybe, right? Yeah, yeah one for if, their library uh, and one for the if group. If you That's didn't right. win, let me know. We'll put you back in the running because I know you guess every <laughs> week. Uh, yes, Agnese, who uh, is a recent um, listener, just wrote in last time, first time. So Agnese... Uh. Um, I have a feeling you're in Italy, but I'm not sure. Anyway, send us your address to twip at microbe.tv. And if you're not in the U.S., we need your phone number for the, uh, the paperwork on the on the box, okay? I promised I won't call you. I just need it for the box, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, a phone call from you would be nice, Vincent. Lots of interesting things to talk about. I'm happy to talk to people. Yeah, I, I like talking, right? They do. All right. Um, Dixon, do you have a hero for us? 
I do. I do. I won't spend time with this because we have a wonderful um, PBS show which aired recently, and uh, it's on the uh, the bat. It's called the Battle to Beat Malaria, and it features the work done at Oxford University of Oxford. <laughs> on the R21 vaccine Mm. that had a remarkable uh, outcome. And the only reason it had a remarkable outcome is because it was being administered by remarkable people because they had something like, um, uh, let's see, how many people did they have in this clinical trial? Um, In the thousands, I'm sure. Uh, It was more than that, though. I mean, it was like 20 or 30,000 people that were involved in this in three different countries. And um, this woman... Uh, Katie Ewer was in charge of the coordination for the follow-up because it's a three-injection vaccine. And she's featured in this video, and I highly recommend you watch this. She was so dedicated. When they revealed the results of the clinical trial, which showed an 80% reduction in mortality in uh, children from the age of zero to five years old, which is what they were aiming for, she cried. She said she just wept with joy and she couldn't stop sobbing. And everybody in the group, including the director of the program, uh, they were all in tears. They just, they had worked so hard on this. If they had gotten another result, they probably would have cried also, but for a different reason. Uh, It's a touching story to see how a bunch of dedicated people, knowing that they were right about the choice of antigen, but not how much of it to give. That was the problem. They couldn't get enough of it on this um, vir- virus capsid-like structure to instill enough immunity to, to combat the infection. And then eventually someone worked out a way of just supersaturating the surface of this uh, Viral capsid. I'm, I'm blocking on that, Vincent. I'm sure it's called another name because there's nothing on the inside, um, and it just uses a carrier to get it to the right spots. And uh, once they made that breakthrough and went back and did a small trial, it was a remarkable difference. It was a matter of how much antigen, not which antigen. And so even knowing nuance like that, you know in the world of vaccinology is uh, mm-hmm. quite a remarkable thing. Hepatitis and, uh, B virus, Dixon. Hep B? Hep B is the carrier, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so um, <laughs> Katie Ewer is one of those dedicated people who tried to get in medical school and she couldn't She couldn't make it in. Mm. Uh, so she, she didn't lose her interest in biology at all. And uh, she ended up in this group and they, they were lucky to get her. Because she ended up as a as a very a tireless worker that uh, lost, I'm sure, you know, weeks of sleep uh, trying to get everybody mm. online in order to get the next shot and following up on these people. And some of them are in rural areas of these countries, and it's very difficult to keep track. And uh, they did it. You she know, was one of the people. It reminds me, there's a great video, uh, a documentary about the discovery of the Higgs boson. Oh, right. And they presented oh. the data to an audience with, with that's Higgs, right. Higgs sitting there. Exactly. And, he, Higgs. and he was crying also. Yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> he spent true. spent his whole life, you know, Absolutely. saying, and they finally see the, the evidence. Isn't that something, right? The God particle. That's right. That's yeah. exactly right. All right. Yeah, very touching story. It, it really makes you believe in research. Well, I didn't want to go to medical school, so I did science. <laughs> <laughs> Neither did I. I did the same thing you did. <laughs> My dad wanted me to go to medical school. But said, no, no, no. I'm not interested. My dad was a doc. I said, nope, not for me. It's funny. Um, Lee, let's talk a little bit about you. Um, where, where Are you from this area? Yeah, I'm a born and raised New Yorker, yeah. which is why, you know, I, I like going on the subway and coming to the studio. <laughs> it's second nature for me. Um, and yeah, I, I always, you know, loved science and microbiology. Even before medical school, I was... Um, briefly a a science teacher actually um, teaching a little bit of microbiology and chemistry, but I did eventually end up in in medical school. And now I am a second year infectious diseases fellow at Weill Cornell, um, having a lot of fun, really enjoying uh, infectious diseases fellowship. Um, This year and next year, mostly focusing on, on research. And my interests are 
mostly in infections in immunocompromised hosts, so like solid organ and cell transplant recipients, um, as well as antimicrobial resistance. So sorry, mm. it's not parasitology, <laughs> but I will say, I, I think I can speak for um, all infectious diseases fellows uh, where when, whenever there's any kind of clinical case that involves parasites, we all get like super excited. I mean, this case was amazing and we love to just put parasites on the differential wherever we can sneak them in. So even though it's not uh, my, you know, my area of research, um, you know, it's an awesome and perennially fascinating field. Where did you go to college? Uh, Wesleyan University okay. up in Connecticut. Okay. And then and medical school at Cornell, right? Then, yeah. Then after, then I was a science teacher for a little while, actually in Singapore um, for a few years. And then uh, came back and I've been stuck in New York. No, it's stuck in a good way <laughs> um, ever since I've done all my, all my training at Weill Cornell. It's hard to leave New York. Now, an infectious disease fellow eventually has to go somewhere else, right? Or could you stay? Well, you know, well, I'll take it one step at a time, but I, I certainly am enjoying uh, enjoying where I am now. Okay, so you could be an attending at Cornell if you. If that sounds like good. Columbia. There are like a lot Columbia. of Columbia. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are lots of places in New York you could go to. A lot of great places in New York. I, I am very happy where I am right now. Okay. Yeah, it's a good part of. By the way, the somebody city. once wrote an article back in the fifties. Uh, when we were in the heyday of our immigration back from the Korean War, we already had the war veterans from the World War II, and um, they they wrote an article. And it was called Manhattan, a Tropical Island, because all the clinics in, in Manhattan were inundated with people. We had a big immigration from Puerto Rico as well, from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And so uh, everybody was uh, talking about parasites in those days. And they didn't go away, folks. They did not go <laughs> away <laughs> as much well, I, as we would have liked it. <laughs> I do a talk for the University of Glasgow, right? The, the fifth in the series is New York City, the center of the developing world. <laughs> <laughs> and you just show the map with, and then you have Africa and all the different Asian and... I would call New York an overdeveloped world, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dixon, you have a paper for us or a concept and a paper, right? I do. I have. Yeah, I do. Uh, I, I, when I saw this paper, I was absolutely thrilled. And uh, I sent the paper to everybody. Uh, I hope that you had a chance to at least look at it. Um, the parasite that it talks about is unfamiliar to most of us because uh, it's not a parasite of humans. It's a, a, a nematode parasite of cattle. And its name is Ostertagia ostertagi. <laughs> now, I know Christina will probably say that differently, because the first time <laughs> I heard this parasite mentioned, I was actually a guest at Dr. Urquhart's uh, laboratory in the University of Glasgow. And this was what he was working on. Uh, because this was a huge uh, cause of illness in dairy cattle, and it still is. And uh, the drugs that have been used for this parasite uh, are first-line um, antiemetics. As soon as they came online, they were sent out into the field to try it out on these parasites. And Merck uh, was one of the developers of a lot of these drugs, and uh, including ivermectin, which they've used – um, almost ad nauseum, and as a result, they've induced resistance in some areas of the world where they have a, a tremendous amount of cattle and uh, and the money to afford the drugs, of course, so that's mm. the other thing. But what they're lacking is something permanent that the worm can't really escape from, and uh, people look at vaccines as those kinds of things, although that's not entirely true. It's, it's probably more stable and more sustainable than drug therapy. If you're relying on one drug, especially if you have a multi-epitoped um, antigen to deal with. They've tried to make antigen um, vaccines against this parasite by simply taking adult worms from infected cattle and incubating them in vitro. And the worm will secrete things. And one of the things that it secretes is called something um, – activation-associated secreted protein, <laughs> for lack of a better descriptor. Uh, and it's, it's totally immunogenic, and it, it works very, very well in calves. 
to prevent them from acquiring the infection at the level that they would prefer them not to have. Uh, and what this antigen does is it prevents the worm from producing as many eggs as an adult as it would ordinarily. And they think that reduction of egg production down below 50% is enough to affect the epidemiology of this in the field. And so they, they think that this is it's a step in the right direction. At any rate, they would like then now to develop a molecular vaccine. And so the molecular vaccine... Eventually, when you read the uh, places where these people are from, and I'll give you the names of all the, all the authors, there are many, uh, Lawrence Zweinberg, uh, Jimmy Borlu, uh, Brega de Decourt, uh, Myrna J.M. Brunt, uh, Sanaz Mohatari, Sonia Serna, Niels C. Reichart, Lee J.M. Says, Angela Van de Dippen, uh, Aaron Schutz, Rud H. P. Wilbers, uh, Cornelius H. Hook, Hoke, Hoka, I guess, and, uh, and, and Edward Clairbout, and finally Peter Geldhoff as the senior, I guess, one of the senior uh, investigators on this. You notice there's a lot of Dutch names in this, and, and a lot of this research was carried out in, in Holland at the Wagnagen University. Uh, the, and, and the, there's a good reason for this. This is an unusual paper in many ways. And one of the ways that it's unusual is that they use, instead of bacteria or cell cultures to express these antigens, they use a plant. Mm -hmm. And the plant is uh, called Nicotinia uh, benthanaminia. Nicotiana. They, how do you pronounce that? Nicotiana. Nicotiana benthamiana. Is well, I nic wanted to say nicotiana because it's uh -huh. nicotine. It's a it's a it's a it's a very sensitive tobacco like plant found in Australia. Mm -hmm. well, a, it's, uh, been, it's, it's, it's a model. Been, it's a model organism. But it is a model organism, yeah. but it's also a very useful commercial organism as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. As I'll get to, this this plant is highly susceptible to a bacteria which can be used to shuttle uh, genes from the outside to the plant's genome or to the plant's cytoplasm uh, using an agrobacter. Uh, and if you insert the gene into the genome of the agrobacter and then transfect or infect the nicotiana, uh, nicotiana, 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 um, nicotiana, <laughs> you get expression of the genes in the plant eventually as well. So they're, they're thinking of using plants as uh, vaccine producers. And it's already been done, of course. And I, I shared with you a picture of a place that I visited many years ago in uh, College Station, Texas. Um, it's now called iBio... Um, its last name is, uh, it's, I'll think of it in a minute, doesn't really matter. It's a big, gigantic plant, uh, no pun intended, which is funded by DARPA for the most part. <clears throat> and they make vaccines, and some of them uh, end up in the Army, uh, and they made an influenza vaccine in plants as a result. They're very easy to make. They're very easy to isolate from the plant. It's almost like making uh, wine. You take the plant and squeeze out the juice, and out comes the protein of your choice. And another two steps, and you've got a purified protein. So, the, and the plants grow very fast, and they're easy to grow, and they grow them in vertical forms. So, you've got all the things in place that you would like to have in order to do the following experiments. And what they did was they expressed this um, protein the ASP protein, in two different uh, expression vectors. One is a pikia. Uh, is that how I'm pronouncing that, Vincent? Pikia. 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 It's, it's, a, it's okay. a yeast. It smells very yes, it sweet. Is. It's related to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, which is the brewer's yeast, but uh, this is not one of those. This is a, a special yeast, which is used for gene expression. Um and it's also used because it glycosylates, uh, whereas a lot of other systems, they don't glycosylate. The plant, on the other hand, has a very limited number of um, glycosylation enzymes. 
And so a lot of their proteins are glycosylated, but a very bland uh, outpouring of varieties. Whereas in mammals, uh, particularly us, we produce a, a plethora of um, kinds of uh, decorations. They're called chemical decorations on the on the on the, the protein. And it, they're involved. That's the in, scientific name for them, Lee. Yeah. Just if you were yeah, decorations. Way, yes, that's <laughs> the way. The, that's you know that's the way the uh, the glycological people working on this refer to them. <laughs> yes, they, they do. Um, <clears throat> And their functions are, well, some of them are known and others are not. Uh, most of them are involved in helping the protein fold properly and maintain its shape. Uh, and so that's a very <laughs> essential function. So what they did was they took this gene that they got from the sequence of this protein and they made a cDNA and then they put it into these two different expression vectors. And then they... Um, got the protein out, they immunized uh, calves with it, and they got nothing, absolutely nothing. It didn't work. That is to say the protein alone didn't work, which was very disappointing. So they went back and they started to ask some more involved questions about the chemistry of this uh, protein from the nature of the secreted products, and they found out that it was glycosylated. And when they did the analysis of knocking off the glycosylation sites and then analyzing the glyco glycosidal residues, they found that there were two primary uh, residues that were uh, associated with the OOASP1 protein. And uh, one was a, uh, an A1 um, fucan of... of uh, hold on just a second, please. I hate it when my phone rings in the middle of all this. It's Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> Probably is. Yes. Looking for another handout, no yeah. doubt. <laughs> yeah, no, and I thank you very much, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. Um, so there were two different uh, uh, glycans that were isolated from the native protein. And when they stripped them off, they were able to purify them and then to discover what they were. So remarkably, what they did next was they took the enzymes that catalyzes the uh, glycosylation for both of those uh, glycosidal residues, and they transfected the tobacco plants with it, and then they transfected the protein in there, and the next thing you know, they were getting properly glycosylated um, the OASP1 protein, which they could then now compare with the native protein that they could collect from these cultures of the adults to see whether or not there was any immunogenicity or protection uh, by using this now uh, totally engineered product. And the answer was, it worked. And the reason why it worked was because the um, epitopes turned out to be the glycosidal residues and the glycosidal residues were um, easy to see. They're not, they're not complicated residues. They have uh, lots of great um, visuals in this article. Um, but we can now say for sure, if you go down all the way down to the end of this article, which I painfully did, reading through all this data, it's, it's worth just going to the end to read their conclusion because – uh, this is a rare conclusion that you get <clears throat> from this kind of work that's been going on for about 40 years now. This is one of the very few successes that have ever been reported with regards to a vaccine developed against a nematode parasite, regardless of whether it's in humans or not. And I'll just read the conclusion. <clears throat> in conclusion, the comparative analysis conducted between a protection protective native antigen and a non-protective P. pastoris recombinant provided important information on the key elements required to induce a protective immune response. In this study, uh, native OOASP1 and a non-protective P. pastoris recombinant were found to be highly comparable on protein structure, but microarray analysis revealed that native OOASP1 induced IgG uh, be highly comparable, um, yeah, induced uh, IgG 
exhibited distinct reactivity towards glycans carrying a core of A13 fucose. That turned out to be the epitope. They had a, a 6 fucose also, but that was not immunogenic compared to the A13 fucose. This glycan motif was verified to be present on the native antigen, but not on the P. pastoris recombinant. The employment of glyco-engineered n bethaminia addressed these inconsistencies in n glycosylation, in particular at the level of core fucosylation and subsequent immunization with the new recombinants, significantly reduced the fecal egg output in O. ostracygi infected calves. These findings are highly promising for the field of recombinant vaccine development as the transition from native to recombinant subunit vaccines of various parasitic nematodes has been difficult. Therefore, this workflow could be a valuable approach for recombinant vaccine development against other parasitic nematodes. And you can think of many that you would like to have a vaccine against. And I know that our friend Peter Otez has been working for years on another secreted antigen from one of the larval stages of hookworm. And uh, it, he's had certain, uh, a certain amount of success with it, but not enough to warrant a commercialization of the vaccine a mo- molecule that he's been working on. So, Dixon, it reduces <clears throat> fecal ed- egg shedding. So I guess they're hoping right. that that reduces transmission, right? That is correct. That is correct. Now, why is this a problem for the cow? What, what does it do to oh, them? Oh, brother, oh. If a cow develops a, um, a fulminating infection, as they would call it, uh, as a calf, that's usually the time that they, at the type of birthing, which is in the spring, which is the same time as the cows are let out of the barn, back out into the field, and the parasite eggs are shed in the feces of the cow. They hatch, they consume material in the fecal matter, and then they develop into, they're related to strongyloides, uh, distantly related to strongyloides. So the worms actually crawl away from the fecal matter uh, into the grass, and they they wait for the cattle to come along. The cattle will not approach a cow pie, as it would, <laughs> the common term is cow pie, right? Yep, yep. They they come within about six inches, and then they stop. It's and good, that zone for between, them. <laughs> well, <laughs> for certain parasites, but not this one, because it can crawl away from the cow pie. Now there are other nematodes which have figure out another strategy. They hitch a ride on fungi, which produce spores. And at some point, they're on the top of the spore, the spore explodes. And it catapults them beyond the zone of repulsion, as it's called. And so there's a lot of really interesting biology that goes on with these with these parasites. But this one in particular is like uh, hookworm larvae or strongyloides larvae. They don't stay put. They travel. They can m- migrate, and uh, so as a result, uh, you you can't re- you can't count on them staying uh, in the in the fecal matter. They're, they've got to be. That's why this vaccine is so important. Uh, there's there's yeah. no way to prevent the cows from grazing, obviously, and there's very little you can do about cow manure in terms of control. And if that were easy to do, then they wouldn't need a vaccine. All they would have to do is collect the cow feces every day. <laughs> <laughs> and then you well, don't laugh. They, there are people doing that and producing methane from it, and then they're using that as a biodiesel or biogas for their uh, energy source for their for their heating and cooling. In the yeah, I was, I was just thinking the the challenge here, right, is that the the clinical manifestations is they get they can get a watery diarrhea. That's right, a huge. They get yeah, decreased milk production, decreased uh, weight awful. gain. Weight so gain. It's a big big economic. I mean, it, I don't think it's of it huge. as killing many cattle, but you know, when no. your cattle's not producing. Um, Milk, um, you know, and I, I wonder if people know the terminology, right? So cattle is the big overarching, right? And then you've got your cows, you've got your bulls, you've got your heifers. So um, as a cow owner myself, as an owner of cattle, I care about these things. And no, and so like, let's take um, my, one of my uh, 
cattle over there in Uganda. So Mary, who normally would produce seven liters of milk a day, and you're counting on that, now five, you're like, okay, so that's, you know, that's impacting, um, you know, maybe the amount of milk that you might be trying to sell for currency, maybe the amount of milk that might be feeding your family. Um, And some of these large commercial operations, um, this can really impact your profitability, um, you know, as well as the, the animal suffering that's involved. No question. Is this a global problem? Yes, it is, because cows are shipped all over the place, uh, and there, you know, there, there is. This, I don't know of any country that doesn't have grazing animals as part of their economic uh, scheme, including people living above the Arctic Circle, uh, you know, with, with reindeer and with uh, caribou. So, cattle is 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 major in terms of livelihood, and, and absolutely right, uh, Daniel. This this uh, has the potential for let's just put it this way if you had a certain worm burden but the female worms were unable to obtain a maximum egg production which has a cost in terms of mm-hmm. the amount of energy that the host has to give up to allow the parasite to produce all those eggs every day i mean it's a thousand or two thousand eggs every day remember we we talk about ascaris is producing uh uh, millions of eggs over its lifespan. And that comes at a huge cost for the host in malnourished areas of the world. So you can imagine a whole herd of animals uh, suffering from this. And uh, it's a vicious cycle. It just keeps uh, affecting it. Um, yeah. And that's I mean, why and maybe the. Yeah, and maybe the worst is your 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 younglings, right? So your yearling yeah, cattle right. go out that's there, right. their first right. exposure. Yeah. Um, exactly. yeah. You know, and in some cases, you know, I say death isn't the big of it. Yeah, in some cases, you know, you lose, um, you know, some of your herd, and and that's you know, I just lost one of my bulls in Uganda, and you know, it's a you know, big big economic hit for uh, you know for you people. Uh, so I learned the, the, by attending a, a meeting one. Uh, uh, the dairy industry in Holland, uh, they were interested in, in producing indoor fodder for the cattle, uh, which was a great idea. Uh, and, and and they're going to that, by the way. There's uh, lots of examples now out there of of uh, dairy farms where they're, they're on several acres of land and they can raise like two or 300 cattle on that small acreage, provided that the food for the cows comes from that building over there. And um, it's, 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 it's very interesting. So that's another aspect of vertical farming that I wanted to bring up. Uh, but, the, but the vertical farm in this case uh, allows this single tobacco plant to grow happily, provided, of course, that nobody who works inside that vertical farm is a smoker. So, Vincent, what virus would we be worried about in this particular instance? Tobacco mosaic virus. You got it. One of the first discovered. And it was the first right. virus discovered, yeah. Nobody uh, in that biotherapeutics, uh, that was the name of the, the place, the um, biotherapeutics, uh, the Caliper Thero Bio- Biotherapeutics was the name of the company. And it's changed its name because now it's associated with the univers- um, uh, Texas A&M University. Um, lots of interesting biology to this. Uh, I will be interested. I would prefer to see a 90% egg reduction or a 95% egg reduction. But notice also that the female worms were smaller than the male worms in the immunized group. The female worms were the same size in the non-immunized group. So there is a price that this female is, is feeling from the immune system preventing her from obtaining enough nutrition to produce the amount of eggs. So what do they do? The worm starts to use a a part of its own self to produce the eggs, and eventually they don't succeed. Uh, There's a similar situation like that with trichinella, where the newborn larvae are produced uh, at a lower rate by worms from immunized animals, and the female worms are much smaller. And they're using some of their own body tissue to put back into larval production, which would never happen in a non-immune situation. By the way, cigarettes have tobacco mosaic virus in them. Here, here. Yeah, it's, here, it's here. viable in, in tobacco that's been dried and rolled up into cigarettes. It See can that? be found in the lungs of smokers. <laughs> that's right. So that company, they, that's their first question. 
You smoke. When you interview for a job, yeah. are you a smoker? And the answer is yes. I'm sorry, we can't use you. Yeah. They won't allow anyone in that building that's ever smoked. It's very hardy virus. Crazy thank, stuff. Thank you, Dixon. Very, very cool story. I like that. You're welcome. Very thank cool. you. I, I sent pictures also. You might wonder what an abomosum is. So I sent you a picture of a, of a cow, a dairy cow, with a uh, cutaway view of its d uh, digestion. And it's a complicated system. As How did seven stomachs like or something like that, right? And then not only that, they're chewing their food twice. They're, it's an amazing <laughs> system when you look at it. Is abomosum one of its stomachs? It is, and that's where the worms live. I they see. live there. So that's the last stomach before the fecal pellet eventually finds its way out of the cow. I was at so a farm. I was on a farm. <clears throat> I don't know when, when, but the cows had these holes in their sides. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Which they can do to sample the stomach contents. Just, exactly. Yeah, cut open exactly. a hole and just leave it there and they're fine. Exactly. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And what do you think they find when they look? I don't know. Ah, they find ciliates and uh, other protozoan parasites. Not parasites, they're symbionts. Yeah. They're, they're the ones digesting the cellulose, and that's where all the methane comes from. So in other words, from the neck down, this cow is an anaerobe. It's called a fistula. A fistula, that's exactly they, right. They put a stopper in it. That's right. And you can sample the rumen. That's right. And see what's going on in there. I guess you could you change their diet They've and you could see what's in the rumen, yeah. That's right. They've also taken, <laughs> and I, I don't know why the animal rights people haven't gotten out of the, uh, after these people. They've taken the urine by catheterization and recycled it through the stomach in the same cow. Because there's um, a lot of nutrition involved in their uh, urine as well. Poor cows. And you know, poor cows is exactly right. But uh, by the way, I meant to ask everybody, mm -hmm. do you know what the average lifespan of a dairy cow is? I have no idea. Take a guess. No, it's Christina just said. Christina, hold that up two fingers there. Sorry, I was coughing. Right. I think maybe, maybe two, or, two or three years. Why is it so you short? Are absolutely correct. Because they can't make milk after that, so they that, sack. Well, they can, but not enough. And they make, eat them then, right? They, they do. They, that's exactly the meat that's source. A tough that's life. Right. I, I feel bad. The cows are peaceful critters, right? They're couch my, potatoes. My, my cow is older than three years, by the way. She's <laughs> well, seven. She's seven. And she's going to go to 12, by the way. You is can't. she pregnant? Did you not say she was pregnant? <laughs> she's no. pregnant. Yeah. I, yes. I don't know if everyone knows this, but yes, Mary is pregnant. She's about three months pregnant. So <laughs> maybe in July, we're hoping for a girl. Yeah, this is her. This is going to be her second. Her first was Peter, who's two. He's a bull, and he's shy, which is funny to see a shy bull. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ferdinand, that was Ferdinand the bull, by the way. Um, so, okay, so Daniel, you had two, but one died, right? <laughs> well, so yeah, originally I had Mary. Um, originally I had Bryony, and then Bryony had Mary, but Bryony passed, and then Mary is still with us. She had Peter. And then Mary is now pregnant again, but I also had a, a large bull, but the bull um, died recently. So, what do they die of? Um, there's a there's sort of a valley fever going around, yeah. um, you oh, know, really? but they die of different things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And Peter was sick recently, but he's recovered. Are these uh, European cattle? No, no, they're the the local local Ugandan. Um, so the, they produce the, a lot less the, milk. The yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. That's right. So, um, oh, I had one more. Yeah, pregnant cows will produce a lot of milk because obviously they've got an offspring to feed when they when they give birth, and so there's a hormone that you can give the cattle that will continue to stimulate milk production after the birth of their calf, and mm -hmm. they can only give that hormone I think for two years, and then after that it doesn't work very well. So that's why the milk production will go down. And that's at that point, it becomes economic to sacrifice the adult cow. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Christina was absolutely on point. Uh, and your, your university does a lot of research on this organism. Do you know anybody uh, doing work on it right now? I, I can't think of a name just now. No, Dan sorry. <clears throat> Daniel, They're all is, in the vet school. They're all in the vet school. Daniel, yeah. do, do people need milk, Daniel? So they don't need milk, but in a lot of places, it can be a great uh, mm -hmm. protein and caloric source. So, okay. Yeah. 
But here Absolutely. in the U.S., we don't really need to be drinking milk. Yeah, we don't need it. It's just, yeah. Well, oh, except as a baby, and we need mother's milk. But yeah. not because of the nutrition. <clears throat> because of the antibodies, right. right? Okay. All right, we have a case from one of our listeners. A couple uh-huh. of months ago, we asked for people to send in cases. We got a couple. So this one's from James, who's at Rocky Vista University. He's written in many times. And this is a 41-year-old male mechanical engineer, former Army Ranger trainee, moved from Denver, Colorado to Chattanooga, Tennessee. He was in his usual state of vigorous health, hiking, doing Spartan races, working on his semi-rural property and commuting to his place of work daily. When about three months previous to his diagnosis, he began having episodes of sudden GI distress with diarrhea followed by itchy hives in the axilla and groin. He treated these episodes with Benadryl and got relief. At 10 p.m. one evening, he had another such episode, again took Benadryl, but began to experience gradual onset, but relentlessly increasing shortness of breath and wheezing. He was taken at high speed to the ER by his wife. He reported that relaxation with a repetitive meditative prayer seemed to control the symptoms but said it was like his throat was closing. <clears throat> Past history includes variable exercise and cold-induced asthma treated with an inhaler as a child with only rare episodes in adulthood related to high exposure to allergens like cat dander. Family history is not contributory. Diet is omnivorous. They had one dog, a labradoodle named Raphael, which they chose because he was hypoallergenic. In the ED, he was treated with bronchodilators, intramuscular epinephrine, and antihistamines, and the symptoms abated. The experienced ED physician ordered a diagnostic test, having seen other similar cases in the region. A lifestyle intervention was successful. Would you say his prayers were answered? (laughs) I don't know. We can't ask any questions, unfortunately. I yeah, I wanted to ask some questions, but I'm realizing we're not allowed well, to. Well, we can't. Diet was <laughs> omnivorous. Yeah. Okay. What, what well, question would you ask, Daniel? Um, I was curious a little bit about, about the diet, but I, we, ha- we have it in there. So I feel like I've got what I need to know. Chattanooga, Tennessee. I guess you yeah, should have stayed in Denver. <laughs> my, my question would, would revolve around... Before his uh, onset of symptoms, what was his – trace back at least six hours. Tell me where you were up to that point mm-hmm. before the symptoms started. Because uh, I have a hyperallergenic response to mice. And I remember once uh, a friend of mine living out in Minnesota had a chicken coop. It was totally enclosed except for the door, of course. Uh, and I walked in. I took two breaths, and I had a similar reaction to the one you just heard about. And I walked out, and it, of course, went away almost immediately. But if I had stayed in that chicken coop, it was inundated with mice. Did you use mice in the lab, Dixon? I did. I had to work under a fume hood. I had to wear a mask, and I, I had to wear gloves. Yeah, that's right. But I, I recognize this symptom symptomatology very well. Do you know what this is, Lee? I don't know what it is, but it's something. <laughs> I'm asking induced. Lee, not you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be, be waiting in suspense for okay. the next episode. I'm curious what you think. Yeah. All right. All right. That'll do it for TWIP 225. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIP. Send your case guesses. Uh, and questions to twip at microbe.tv. We will reveal this one in a month, right? Not the next episode, but the one after that. So four yeah, weeks. Four weeks. You have some time. And if you like what we do on this program and all the other ones, please consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today from Wild Cornell Medical Center, Lee Gottesdiener. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having <clears throat> me. It's fantastic. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Yeah, you're welcome, Vincent. And to everybody else, it's a pleasure seeing you again. I think we're going to change the name of our show to This Millennium in Parasitism. How's that? Sure. <laughs> Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, parasiteswithoutborders.com.
Thanks, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone be safe. Christina Nell is at the University of Glasgow. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, everyone. This was fun. And Vincent Racaniello. Please, please get better. What's that, Dixon? Oh, I will. Yes, p- feel better. I told Christine to feel better. Yes. Thank, thank you. you I will. I'm sure I will. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. So now, Lee, you have the honor of doing the closing, right? <laughs> You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. Parasitic.